I'd like to welcome everyone to the start of the ECE 125 celebration. I thank you for all coming out on this beautiful day during finals. I know that's not uh, easy, especially uh, for some of the students, so I appreciate that. And I'll be very brief so we can get to the start of today's programs, but I hope that everyone uh, will enjoy the, this afternoon as well as tomorrow, uh, as activities ending in the gala tomorrow evening. And, uh, you know, I'm really quite proud uh, I get to serve currently as chair of the ECE department. My name is Ken Barner. And it's really incredible to me that the department is celebrating its 125th anniversary. Uh, but I must say, I can think of no other discipline that really has continuously reinvented itself and had a bigger impact on society than uh, electrical and computer engineering, starting from the electrification of the country to electromechanical systems to the semiconductor revolution to the uh, communication uh, revolution to uh, you know everything from smart cars to uh, social media that we have today. So uh, computing uh, and all of those kinds of technologies that have incredible impacts on today's society. So I'm incredibly proud uh, to be part of the department and celebrate its 125th anniversary. So with that, I will hand it over to President Asanas who will start us off. Grab this. Thank Dr. you, Chris. Ken. Yes. Thank you, Ken, uh, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dan Sasanis. I'm honored to be serving as your president uh, and, and, and very happy and thrilled to be part of this celebration of this uh, uh, great department, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, which is now embarking into the next 125 years of its history, and I hope way beyond that. Um, sometimes I feel that Ken has been part of those first 125 years. So not, not all of them, the majority. So, so uh, w what is uh, amazing is if we step back in time and uh, think about 1891, when the, the, the whole country is embarking into the Industrial Revolution, and at, at that time, basically, in the old shack uh, that we had there in College, South College, I think. I wasn't there at the time, but I believe it was there. Uh, we formed two great departments, uh, electrical engineering and, uh, of course, computer engineering, although at the time it, I'm not sure that it was called computer engineering, and mechanical engineering. And I have to tell you, and don't tell anybody else, it's just a secret for this audience, these two are the most important pillars for any great college of engineering. And I believe that because here we are in an audience of electrical engineers. I'm in a mechanical engineer myself, so you know, why would I think otherwise? So uh, absolutely important, critical, has played a transformational role this department into the history of our university uh, with uh, great, great discoveries uh, over the years. I have uh, uh, listed just a few which truly have changed the world uh, uh, from uh, our contributions in the development of the early internet in the 70s uh, to the transformational work that we've done with, uh, at the time, what it was known to be finger works, and now it's probably all the Apple uh, computers and handhelds that we have with the multi-touch uh, uh, screen technology that uh, Professor John Elias and uh, Wayne Westerman developed, and both have been inducted to the National Academy of Inventors. Uh, and all these subsequent contributions that we've made to all kinds of fields, uh, photonics, photoelectronics, uh, vehicle to grid technology, hardware and communication software. And this is great stuff that uh, obviously is not just conceptualized here, but it's making its road, its application on the road and on the world. If we think of some of our most successful uh, uh, graduates, people like Mark Mendet, he has come up with 53 patents and I think he has at least another 20 in the making. Every time I talk to him, you know, there's another thing that he has invented. Uh, and our new uh, students who are going to be joining the world, very inventive, innovative uh, people like uh, our senior Keith uh, Doggett, who is part of the GeoSwappers, uh, this uh, great new software that is connecting people and places and activities, and I think it's going to be very, very useful. I want to be one of the early investors myself. So it, it's amazing. And, and when we think about what the next 125 years uh, are going to bring to us. Uh, first, uh, I do believe that there will be great innovations in education and in the way we prepare our students to live and learn uh, in this world uh, of today and tomorrow. 
Uh, we are leading the way here with our interdisciplinary and global perspectives that we have here in the university, as well as this, uh, this philosophy of innovation entrepreneurship that we want to impregnate onto every one of our students uh, uh, who graduate from the university and enter the world. We teach them in innovative new ways, like the, the I-suite that you're about to cut the ribbon tomorrow, which is a very innovative design st studio where they will conceive, design, prototype, and test ideas. Uh, another great example is uh, our electronic systems laboratory, where we test, the measure, design, analyze software, equipment, and other things, and our collaboration hubs. So great environment to educate our students, and then, of course, uh, make our students give to the world through great initiatives, such as initiatives in cybersecurity, in big data science, in uh, robotics, in clean energy, uh, in autonomous vehicles, and so many other areas, which include additive manufacturing. Uh, so I want to be brief intentionally, but uh, I do want to communicate to everybody here my excitement about the well-being of the department, for that matter, our, our great College of Engineering. I've said uh, in, in a number of different uh, opportunities and fora that if there's anything that uh, we need now is to expand our excellence uh, in electrical, computer engineering, and other fields. Uh, our faculty work hard. There's great student interest and demand. And we're going to expand our faculty body. I've said several times that I envision that over the next five years, we'll add 50 net new faculty members in our College of Engineering, and I hope electrical and computer engineering will be beneficiaries, among other areas, of this great expansion, not just of our intellectual assets, but also of our capital assets, as we imagine new facilities uh, on the STAR campus and beyond, facilities that will promote interdisciplinary team science in fields like big data. We had a fantastic symposium uh, a, a week ago today, the whole afternoon, uh, were a lot of faculty members there from uh, the entire college and beyond. And I mean, this is the kind of collaborative activity that will propel us into the next 125 years. So it's a real pleasure, exciting lineup. I'm going to turn it over to these fellows here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so there we are. Uh, I want to join in the celebration of the 125th anniversary of the electrical and computer engineering program. I feel fairly certain the word computer wasn't there 125 years ago, but, but maybe not. What we're going to focus on today, however, is not so much the technical or scientific aspects of the work of the people, the students, and the faculty in the department. We're focusing on getting from a lab table to a commercial blockbuster. How do you get from a research environment, such as the one that exists here at the University of Delaware, to Apple Computer or Google or Alphabet or Microsoft or any of the other large companies that are deploying these technologies invented here. And you know, honestly, I think it's probably not the case that getting from the lab table to a commercial blockbuster is at the top of every academic um, faculty member's mind. I'm guessing that's not necessarily uh, the case. So many faculty members are now branding themselves in addition as inventors or as entrepreneurs, which almost every year seems to be being applied to new kinds of people doing new kinds of things. I want to introduce, we have a wonderful uh, group of speakers this afternoon who, who deal with this issue of commercialization of scientific and engineering technology. I want to introduce you first to Jeff White, who's here at my right whose bio reads pretty much like a who's who of technology giants, including Hewlett Packard, Agilent Technologies. He's the founder and CEO of Media Analytics, a powerful media monitoring and data analysis firm. But what's probably his most famous endeavor is Fingerworks. And I'm guessing that most of you in this, how many, of, is there anybody in this room who does not know what Fingerworks is? Excellent. Oh, okay, we have a few who don't. Good, that makes me feel better. I had to look it up myself initially. Jeff, you're not a computer scientist, right? Uh, electrical engineer. Electrical engineer, okay. You pretty much stumbled into 
this technology that every single one of us uses right now on our iPads, our iPhones, uh, all these devices where we can, instead of using a mouse or instead of using a stylus mm -hmm. uh, or instead of typing commands as it used to be the case, now we can just yeah. touch with our fingers and make magical things happen. Did you know this was, how did you get, how did you stumble into this? Uh, well, I had just um, been part of a, a biotherapeutics um, initiative uh, with the company. Actually, it was also part of it was came out of Udell, so I have quite a long history connection with Udell on many fronts. But um, and we had been acquired. I was out looking for my next adventure, and I was at a venture fair in uh, the Union League in Philadelphia, and there was a person off in the corner with a table and had a laptop and this little pad. And I said, "Oh, so what are you here for? You know, what's your product or service all about?" You didn't know him, right? Didn't had never met the person before okay. in my life. As soon as he struck, you know, the first gesture on the on the pad, and I saw what happened on the screen, I, I first didn't believe that it was actually connected. And I you said, "That it was a device, magic trick." I said, "Is that device actually doing that?" Because I got it right away. I got how transformational that multi-touch technology could be in the world of uh, uh, input devices. So you in, did you envision at that moment, I mean, did it flash through your head, the idea that you could be holding a device in your hand and make things happen on the web or make things happen on a screen or someplace else? Were mm -hmm. you thinking about that at that point? No, not, not so much in the hand. Okay. But uh, if, if, for those that date some of us, if you remember the movie <laughs> Minority Report? Right. So the, all the hands, but that was the first thing I thought of was, wow, we could do Minority Report, right, in real life for, for, for the everyday person. Okay. And so you talked to these, there were two guys there, right? Uh, at the time, there was one individual. Okay, who was that? Frank Lytle, and he had been um, uh, uh, put on part time by uh, John and Wayne to help uh, kind of propagate the Fingerworks message and go out and raise a little capital and try to find some new uh, uh, channels for revenue. And so you asked him, "Who are these two other guys?" Right. And yeah. and they told you what? Uh, I said, "Well, there's two a uh, professor and his postdoc." Uh, a student from At MIT Indiana. or something, right? Or Stanford <laughs> or what? I said, University of Delaware. I said, well, that's like less than an hour away. I said, well, I want to meet these two people. So can you set up a meeting? Be honest. When you heard they were from the University of Delaware, were right. you, did you shrug your shoulders and say, oh, yeah, of course, right? Or did you, were you a little surprised? I was a little surprised. Um, you know, typically you would, you would hear more about like kind of Penn and some of the bigger institutions of the West Coast, the Stanford's of the world, and being part of Hewlett Packard for 20 years, an agile or West Coast based company, there was uh, you know quite a bit of that Valley mentality, and so I was I was surprised, but I was intrigued, and actually I was you know kind of happy because it was literally right down the road from my house. I lived you know 30 minutes away. So. And you wanted to meet them, of course. So I presume you did go meet them. Did you see them in their lab? Uh, so quick. Quick story about that. First time in Evans Hall, I'm sitting with John. He's explaining the, the history of Fingerworks. John Westerman. Uh, 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 John Elias. John Elias. And he said, hey, you want to see the operation? I said, sure. So we get up, we walk around down the hall, we turn into this innocuous lab, and there's three young guys sitting at a bench, and there's chips and ribbon cables everywhere, and they're soldering things, and they're programming, and one of them stands up and says, hi, I'm Wayne. Nice to meet you. And uh, this is the operation. And I said, okay, well, we're, this is where you're inventing, but where's everything else? And so, well, we, we have a third party manufacturing the product down in Newark, uh, an assembly house. We do all our warehousing and stocking and shipping out of John's garage. And we do R&D here. And all the order management's done. They point to a screen. So, you know, that computer screen there, that's, that's our order system. We get orders online from our website through emails. And they, we process the credit cards. If they clear, we go to John's garage and we ship out a product. I said, well, how do you do customer support? And this is literally the truth. There's a cell phone sitting in the middle of the, the bench. And another uh, undergrad student named James said, see that cell phone? We keep it here. And whoever's in the room, when it rings, picks it up and answers the question. I went, OK, lab bench, garage, website, um, and starving students who need some part-time money. It sounds like a startup. <laughs> and did they know at the moment they met you in the lab, this is Mr. Moneybags? Uh, I mean, do you think that they made that connection right away, or? I, I, don't, I don't know if they did or not. Um, I think John had a hunch, because I told John, I, I kind of, in a polite, more professional kind of HP way, let him know all the deficiencies in his go-to-market strategy and why he wasn't moving forward the way he wanted to, and what he'd need to do to fix it, and that I was interested in investing, if you had the right personnel from a business acumen and marketing acumen to help you with that. I mean, you were the brains behind the technology. And he just kind of nodded, you know, John's methodical way, okay, well, thanks, and I left. Got an email the next day, could you come back down? I came back down a day later. And he said, well, you know, Wayne and I talked, and everything you said, we actually believe and, so, and, and, and think you're right. So 
us, instead of us going out and finding somebody and you investing, why don't you just come and do this? So you seem to have all the, you know, you seem to know what the problems are. You think you can fix them. Why don't you come fix them for us? If they were asking you to be their boss. Yeah, to be essentially, a partner. Essentially, or yeah. to be a partner in, yeah. the, in the business. Now, when you first met them and you had this, I guess, just two days basically of conversations and then, yeah. you know, they asked you to be, to come work, work with them, uh, had you assessed their operation enough to, to think it through and say, you know, are they actually selling any of these? Is there any money in this? Did you, what was your observation initially? Uh, yeah, the three things I, I look for. You don't always get them, but the best things. One is the product, is there true value, kind of breakthrough value uh, uh, if, at, at the user level, right? Or could there be? Um, and how well is it protected? You don't always have to have patents, but it helps, right? So, and they had that in spades. I mean, that ended up being a cornerstone to what we ended up with Apple. They had already done those things, in other words. I tell you, the best thing John did for Wayne wasn't helping get his doctor's degree. It was making sure they patented everything along the way, okay? Because it turns out they had a wedge into the market with only two other people that really could play at the time. And, and not to get too far off the path, but you know, that was fundamental. I saw that. Two, they had a product that they actually had a product that worked. It wasn't slide whipping and, you know, let me tell you what we're going to do. They actually had a product that was built and complete you could test. And three, and most importantly, someone paid them for it, right? Now, they, they weren't selling a lot, but someone, there's no better way to sit, test value than to say, will somebody pay you money for that service or product? So and they were doing all three of those things. Yep. So those are three lessons right to begin with, okay? Yep. You've already learned something from Jeff White. Now, uh, you, you just in passing a second ago mentioned this little company, uh, some kind of fruit. Oh, Apple Computer. Uh, but, you, but you were not involved with Apple Computer at that point, were you? Or no, were you? I was not. I, I had been in the past with HP, had actually worked uh, with them in and, and some behind the scenes development, and actually on the uh, Apple Newton, for those that are very old. So we were supplying storage technology into the Newton from HP. So. Okay. All right. So then you got involved with this company, mm -hmm. and then some magic happened. I mean, and I don't know whether you just waved a wand or what happened. What, how did you get, and, and let's do this briefly, how did you get from the point where you decided, I'm doing this, mm -hmm. to the point where Apple Computer said, we'll pay you 60 gazillion dollars for it? I wish it was. Yeah, well, whatever. Uh, you, you tell uh, us what it was. No. So, um, okay, so briefly, um, we decided we didn't want to build out a company and take 10 years to become the next Apple or whomever or HP or Logitech, okay? That was, that was, and that was where we were aligned, which was very critical to day one, that we, that we didn't want to do that. But we wanted the technology to be pervasive. So the, the most straightforward path, not to ease, but the straightforward path was to be part of other people's systems. So it was an OEM strategy. So take our technology like Intel inside. So once we did that, now you narrow the universe down to here are the players that would likely want to use your technology. And then one of the other things I learned through my experience is that when you partner with somebody, regardless of what field it's in, they tend to be the people at the end of the day that know you the best. And if they know you the best, they're the ones most likely to say, you'd be much better off if you lived under my roof. And that's what Apple did with you? Apple was the furthest along. I can tell you a quick breakthrough moment. I read an article uh, in Time Magazine. Steve Jobs was quoted. This is back when the iPod came out, and they were talking about how they're going to resurge Apple to its prominence again. And he said, we were built on user interface, and that's how we're going to reestablish the company again. And that's when we knew, like, okay, we've got them. And keep in mind, the iPhone had not yet been invented. No, it was two years away. It was, was a couple years away. All right, so then uh, just, just finish up that, tie that up in a knot. Apple Computer comes to you and says, mm -hmm. no, we don't want to lease your technology or mm -hmm. purchase your technology or, or, or get the patent from you or something mm -hmm. like that. They said, we want to buy it lock, stock, and barrel. Mm -hmm. Was that a... An astonishing moment for you? Uh, no, so was it, was actually, it was actually the inverse. They wanted okay. the license. We wouldn't give them the terms they wanted. So they had, they had three choices, okay? Uh, they could, the, uh, four choices. They could license at the rate we wanted, okay? We could, we could do it with the, at the rate they wanted, okay? They could walk away and keep using the technology they had, which wasn't as good, and, but it was, it was something they had. Or, oh, maybe you could just buy us. And then there's, then there's no question about what you And you proposed that to them? So we proposed that to them. And that's where we ended up. Okay. And the rest is history, as, you, as it will. Now, I want to bring in uh, some additional panel members now. Uh, gentlemen, can you come, please come out, and, and I'll introduce you. All right. While the other panelists are coming in, I just want to ask you, Jeff, was there any federal money involved in uh, Senator Coons right in the middle? All right. Uh, was there any federal money involved in, in the story up to this point? 
Not that I'm aware of. Okay, all right, no federal interface at this point. I'm going to introduce additional panelists now, broaden the conversation to include U.S. Senator Chris Coons in the center here, who was first elected to the Senate in 2010, soon after a political debate that occurred right, right in here. this very spot <laughs> on this very stage at the University of Delaware. Of course, uh, Senator Coons had previously served in government leadership positions here in Newcastle County in Delaware, and before that with the W.L. Gore Company, uh, also based here in Delaware. And although he has a wide variety of responsibilities in the U.S. Senate, for purposes of today's program, I want to mention his membership on the Senate's Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee. Um, uh, next to him is uh, Professor Dennis Prather, who's been a UD College of Engineering alumni professor since 1997. Dr. Prather has authored or co-authored over 400 scientific papers. He holds more than 40 patents, has written 10 books or chapters. He's uh, his, probably his most famous work is his work in millimeter wave technology, very short wave. Uh, or high frequency technology, and as I understand it, not an expert now, it's technology that's useful in military and security applications, it's the kinds of things like scanners that can see through surfaces, see through clothing, or in navigation can see through obstructions. It's also used in high speed communications over short distances. Think maybe about a car driving along a street communicating with the stop sign on the side or with the pedestrian about to step out into the crosswalk or something like that. And quickly communicate that to the car, or maybe a drone or a weapon system that uses that same kind of communication. And at the far, your far left is Professor Sean Wang of the UD class of, 19, of uh, 1992. He's an adjunct professor in the University of Delaware's electrical computer engineering program, soon to be entrepreneur in residence at UD. He describes himself as a serial entrepreneur. I think it's fair to say that uh, virtually everybody on this stage, possible exception of me, uh, could characterize themselves as serial entrepreneurs. He has founded or co-founded more than a dozen high-tech companies over the past 10 years, just the past 10 years, in um, um, uh, a field of lasers, instrumentation, and medical devices. He's the founder and CEO of B&W Tech here in Newark, which produces photonic instruments and analytical instrumentation, medical systems, and lasers. One of them is called a tactic ID, and it uses lasers and light technology to detect and identify chemicals uh, and toxins, so you could point it at my wrist and find out maybe what my cholesterol level is or whether I've been taking bad drugs or what kind of other problems are going on in my body without piercing through it, um, just as an example. He holds, uh, as I said, about 40 patents. He has more than 20 patent applications pending in the areas of optical instruments, lasers, spectroscopic sensors, and, other, and another of his companies called Light Cure makes laser therapy devices that you could point at my bad knee and make it feel better in a very short period of time. So I, I want to welcome all, all of you to this panel here. The thing I want to point out to our audience is that, so we now have on the stage three or four, if you count Dr. Asanis, uh, scientists, engineers, technicians, people you would not necessarily think of first as entrepreneurs or as business people, but every single one of the people on this stage is now involved in business and has made a connection between the kind of tech, highly technical, innovative um, technology that they're involved in and the commercial, successful commercial world. I want to ask our new panelists for Senator Coons, first of all, I just asked Jeff White whether in his, the story he was just telling us about finger works, whether federal funds were involved in that. And he said he didn't think so at this point. But your job in the Senate, at least, is to try to find ways to goose this process on academic campuses by helping to underwrite the kind of combination between technology and commercial success. How do you persuade people in Washington? How do you go about that part of the job? Well, could you define goose for us? <laughs> that, would, that would be helpful. Accelerate. Uh, boost. Accelerate. Boost. Encourage. Juice. Feed. <laughs> Something like that. OK, just, just asking. Great to see you, Ralph. Um, thanks. <laughs> thanks for the chance to be with you for the celebration of the 125th anniversary of the department. And um, thank you for what you all do to help uh, continue to make Newark, Delaware, a a hub of innovation and uh, discovery and translation 
uh, into the commercial marketplace. Um, there's a number of different ways that I engage in this, so I'll just touch briefly on a few of them. First, as an appropriator, uh, I'm one of the folks responsible for um, making decisions about how we spend about $1.017 trillion uh, this federal fiscal year. Um, more than half of that is defense, um, but the rest of it is spread across a very wide range of areas. Um, two of the appropriation subcommittees on which I serve, uh, one where I'm the ranking, fully funds the Small Business Administration and all the different initiatives and programs it has, um, and, an, and another, Commerce, Justice, Science, um, has science under it, and another, Energy and Water, surprisingly, is where most of science comes. Um, so I, I'm part of the subcommittees that fund, for example, the federal labs and all the basic science, the National Science Foundation, and a lot of the grants that it gives uh, out to colleges and universities, uh, and new in the past year, uh, Manufacturing USA, which comes through the Department of Commerce, uh, which, through Nimble, um, should provide roughly $70 million uh, worth of federal grant funding uh, to a national network of invention and innovation that will be headquartered here at the University of Delaware uh, with a two-to-one match from other partners. So um, the single largest piece of the goosing that we're talking <laughs> about uh, would be um, working in close collaboration and partnership with the University of Delaware uh, leaders to help support um, the $70 million federal investment in Nimble, uh, which is, I think, a fantastic model for how to take an emerging technology, scale it, and engage local workforce, intellectual property, uh, transition translation work, um, startup businesses, and long established and significant players, in this case, uh, in biopharmaceutical manufacturing. Um, but there's other things that are federally funded that also benefit either specific research and work at the University of Delaware or smaller or startup companies here. I'll touch on two of them briefly. One, a bipartisan uh, change to the R&D tax credit um, that came into force at the end of the last Congress that makes it possible for early stage pre-profitable technology companies to access the R&D credit for the first time. That wasn't previously the case. To benefit from the R&D credit, you had to be a profitable company. Most startup companies are years before they are profitable. And it's specifically designed in a way that makes it accessible for early stage startup companies in technology fields. Last, SBIRs. Uh, this is a long established federal grant program with which you're well familiar um, that isn't well aligned with commercialization. Uh, I had a bill in the last Congress with Senator Rich of Idaho um, to try and tweak how SBIR grants are given to encourage uh, the filing for intellectual property, early commercialization, market studies. Um, so from very small grants to very large grants, um, I think my goal is to not just help deliver some of the resources, but to better align them with commercialization and with the needs of this community. Okay. Dennis Prather, um, I wanted to ask you about the kind of serendipity that Jeff talked about just a couple of minutes ago when he bumped into these guys, figured out what they were doing, and, re and had an aha moment and said, oh, wow, you know, this can go someplace. Your career, uh, which also involves multiple companies uh, and, the la and getting from the lab to a blockbuster, I think also had some moments of serendipity. Uh, was, was there a moment as, as you were developing something where you were doing it for scientific purposes, you were deep in your research, perhaps completely thinking about your research, uh, when you said, you know what, this could have some real commercial success, I wonder how I go about doing that. Did that sort of thing happen to you? Did you have that knowledge already? Tell us that piece of your story. I'm still waiting for that to happen. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, so my path to becoming an entrepreneur is somewhat unusual because I was an academic first. So I, I fresh PhD, got my first offer at the University of Delaware, and uh, I actually talked to a really good friend of mine who was a successful pro professor in his own right, and uh, I'll never forget what he told me. He's like, you know, being a professor is all about people. And, you know, I'm thinking it's about research, it's about papers, it's about teaching, you know, and I'm going in there all eager beaver. And the truth is I didn't understand, frankly, what he meant until many years later. And, uh, and, and, and I see it in my career in the Navy, uh, 35 years Navy captain. Uh, I see it at the university, but more importantly, I see it on the, on the entrepreneurial level where team, uh, team spirit and team considerations is the utmost important. Without your team, you have nothing. 
and that goes from the Navy, the guy next to you that's running up the hill, or uh, the person in the lab standing next to you giving good ideas exchange, or the people that you rely on within a company to help move it forward. And uh, I think, you know, so from my perspective, uh, our path to being successful entre entrepreneurs, and I mean this seriously, it's not about me, it's about the team, uh, was sort of uh, serendipitous every step of the way. Uh, so we began, frankly, <clears throat> as researchers in a lab with no intention of being entrepreneurial, just developing good technology, frankly, tr trying to survive to the next grant. Okay, uh, and, then, and then suddenly you get good ideas, and that's the role of an electrical engineer. In fact, all engineering is to really solve problems. And being a Navy officer helps me essentially have a, a feeling or appreciation for what relevant problems are, are needed to be solved, especially from a military standpoint. And so we always drove our research in a way that sort of had to be driven by making an impact. And, and, and it turns out that that was a pretty good strategy, unbeknownst to me at the time, because if you're relevant and you have good solutions, people will fund your work. And moreover, if you're, if you're good at what you do and you're relevant at what you do, then there's usually a commercial opportunity, okay? So for us, it sort of happened in this uh, serendipitous route without an aha moment. And did you instinctively recognize the, uh, the idea that, oh, this technology or whatever it is I'm working on now could have this and this and this practical use in the real world? Did, were those things that popped into your head or did others on your team say, you know, somebody could use that to do X, <laughs> Y, and Z, and then it exploded in your head and said, yeah, sure, why not? Let's tweak it this way. How, yeah. I'm trying to get at the mental process here. Were you thinking as a scientist about just developing that technology, or did you get in your head the idea that this can be applied to, to solve this specific problem that these people or this system or whatever is having? Yeah. So I'll never forget our first opportunity because Senator Kuhn has talked about the SBR program. So, so just to give you a little bit of perspective, every DOD agency, in fact, more so than just DOD, but that's what I'm most familiar with, is taxed at the highest levels, where essentially their budget comes in at X dollars, and they have to give some percentage of that to an SBIR program. What so, is SBIR? Forgive sorry, my Small ignorance. Business Innovation and Research. Okay, sorry, in my ignorance. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so what happens is that when you do good research for your sponsors who are at these uh, research agencies, a lot of times they think of these opportunities to commercialize it for you because they, they don't want to see it stop in a paper. They don't want to see it stop at a patent. They want to see it, frankly, transition to the field. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, that's my sole purpose right now is to, I don't need any more papers. I don't need any more patents. I want to make a difference, okay? Okay, students, don't be listening yeah. to that. You yeah. still have to write your papers. <laughs> especially All my right. students, okay? Especially my students. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to talk, turn to Sean Wong for a moment. Um, your story also begins with some serendipity. You didn't sort of start out thinking, I'm going to invent this tactic ID thing, you know, and here's how I'm going to point a device at Ralph's knee and make it all feel better. Uh, that's not how it happened. No. Tell I, us a little bit about your story. Yeah, I, I think unfortunately I never had any blockbuster or some kind of unicorn kind of a, you know, invention so, or, or, or product. And uh, uh, since, you know, panel here mentioned about SBIR, the uh, first job I had uh, many years ago, I actually do nothing but SBIR for six, seven years. So I sort of get sick tired of it because a lot of paperwork and a lot of things is invented in the lab, you know, one demonstration looks good. There's no market, there's no real utility in many cases. So uh, I started a company actually, I would say it's a very humble start. Um, back in 1997, with $1,000 in the bank, and there's no product. There's no product, there's no patent. And, but I see the need. The need at that time is a laser, high power laser. Uh, give example, if a doctor wanna use a laser for surgery, you cannot just go buy a laser because you have to buy the laser, you have to you know, buy a fiber, so deliver the laser to the point of use, have to use electronic drivers, have to do some thermal control. So my business model is very simple. It's a total solution. So I put everything together and supply to a company, you know, making a surgical device using laser. So that's the uh, humble starting point. So I think the key here, especially you know, for people in the academic world. I think there's a lot of times the so-called inventor's trap. Yeah, the, 
the things you invented have a pattern. Sure, it's a unique. Oh, it's the best. Okay, but the key is the value proposition to the customer. What you can propose make it relevant to some people. Some people willing to pay and willing to buy. I think that's a key. So in the business world, no matter you're a small company or, or a big company, there is a full basic question. It's a cost, cost book question. Question number one, who is your customer? Who is your ideal customer? Question number two, what their need? What their want? The third question, what's your outcome or what you can provide? And fourth, of course, because. There's a lot of because. If you're a small company, people say, you know, you want two people, so why I want to buy from you? Or your companies without manufacturing, without finance, people say, you know, it's a scary. So you need to have a lot of because. It sounds simple, like only four questions. But if you can answer this four question well, you can be a very successful business. So I, forgive me, I got to go back to question. So question number one was, who is your customer? And you're talking about finding a customer first and then proceeding to m work with the technology and find the money to fund it and so on and so forth. Senator Coons, that sounds a little bit like what you were talking about earlier in the sense of making the federal uh, rules and regulations and funding procedures connect with those who are looking to find the customer and coming up with the technology as, as distinct from just chasing after a grant. One of the challenges for tech transfer and innovation um, is there needs to be a virtuous cycle where an intimate understanding of a customer um, has to be tied to an understanding of what's your trajectory of development and innovation and then has to be sustained by financing a workforce that can help continue to develop it and intellectual property that's robust enough that you can protect your new product that you're delivering to this customer. That, it, is, it isn't really just a one, two, three, four. It's more of a, it's a resonance Circular. structure. It, it's, okay. it's something that keeps moving in a continuous cycle. Um, the eight years I was in-house counsel at Gore, um, one of our most important roles, there aren't titles at Gore, but there's a, a role that's known as a product specialist, which is someone who is neither a lab researcher nor a field salesman. They're really both. Their, Gore, their, their goal um, from a Gore concept is to really deeply and intimately know this particular customer and to see where they're trying to get with their next generation or their next application and deeply understand what the company's research trajectory is and what its capabilities are and to be a matchmaker between them. Um, and that's the sort of iterative relationship that leads to genuinely category redefining innovation. And that's the sort of solution which if you can deliver to a customer, you can command a very high price. Because what you're giving isn't just a slightly cheaper shoelace nib or a slightly more attractive house paint. You're giving them something that changes what they're capable of doing in a way that meets their most central needs. Okay, now I'm gonna take a little detour here because Dr. Wang took us back to 1997, I think you said. And I'm gonna ask him to take us back farther because for the students in this room, you need to hear this story. <laughs> you came to the United States from China. Yes. When? Uh, I can remember very clearly, 1985, the summer 1985, I think I landed in Newark, uh, I think the August 23rd or 24th, with two and a half dollar in debt. Two and a half dollars in your pocket? Or in two, debt. In debt. Okay. <laughs> so the basically... But, but uh, you got taxi fare? <laughs> yes. Uh, the night before, I landed in uh, JFK with $50 in my pocket. And uh, there's a currency control that time, so you only can convert in $50 US dollar. So the first night, I spent about $30 lodging the transportation. And the second day, I went to the uh, Greyhound station, tried to buy a ticket. The ticket cost 22.5. So it's a two and a half dollar short. Uh, we're not getting detail how to get a, a two and a half dollars, but in any case, <laughs> I came here and uh, you know we. Said wait, wait a minute! Half. You were buying a ticket at at the bus station in New York to yes. come to the University of Delaware. Uh, yes, Newark. With all due respect, you came from China and you were going to the University of Delaware. Why? I had my uh, uh, you know uh, math degrees in physics, and uh, so I, I attended university for my uh, PhD degree, and uh, I accepted here, and uh, 
uh, get a full scholarship. Uh, there's another story, actually, it's a good one. It's a very good one. Actually, two weeks after I arrived here and I also received the uh, offer from Johns Hopkins University for scholarship. So I went to uh, Dr. E. Full scholarship at Johns Hopkins University two weeks after he arrives at the University of Delaware with just enough money to buy a bus ticket. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> so I went to Dr. E. Some of them you know, here know Dr. E. My supervisor, Dr. E, Dr. Hansberger. So I went to Dr. E and said, hey, you know, I'm going to Johns Hopkins. They say, no, 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 you don't want to go. I know the University of Delaware is the best for you. Delaware, University of Delaware is a good, as a good as Johns Hopkins. <laughs> so I think this is a, a really true for me, and it turned out to be, uh, I think if you're looking back my career, uh, if I'm, you know, I went to Johns Hopkins, I'm probably a, a scholar in physics or something, and it, uh, but here I pursued the engineering degrees, and uh, what I find out is, uh, I think the course here right now is more challenging, but at that time it's a, it's a less challenging for me. So <laughs> I start kind of venture out a little bit and it's starting to broaden my uh, knowledge base, take classes uh, in the business schools, economics, macro or microeconomics, and a little bit, you know, do a little bit moonlighting. So I, I, if I trace it back my entrepreneurial activities, here's a place. And that's the point I was hoping you would bring out here, and I think that resonates with every single <laughs> one of the people on this stage, is that you did not go to Johns Hopkins and get buried in, burrowed into a, a narrow field where you would have done outstanding work, I'm sure. You came to a place where maybe the courses weren't as tough as you thought they would be, so you had spare time to do some economics. You had spare time to do some business stuff. You met other students, you, you branched out, and now, today, your business is manufacturing in Newark, Delaware. You're coming up with your new ideas in Newark, Delaware, and that's true for everybody on this stage, really. Uh, and the key lesson, I think, in that from all of you is the importance of open mind breaking out of the channels or the pre prescribed ways of proceeding down your career path. Jeff, I want to come back to you. I actually want to come back to all, all of you, because I know Dennis Prather has an interesting point on this as well. Um, as you deal with academics, when you, when you deal with professors who do outstanding work in engineering and computer work and so on, do you find sometimes that their scope is a little narrower than you wish it were? Uh, or do you just do you luck out and find those who, who have broader scopes? No, it's, you know, it's a it's a kind of a Pareto of of individuals, right? You have some that are that are are, are academicians, but they're, they're but they're trapped like in a business person's body. They just want to get out. And there are others <laughs> that love that world. And um, when I had done a lot of work on the in the bio sector with UD, I mean, we were living off of grants and NIH grants and whatnot. Um, to get to the next breakthrough, and, and in that case, so, some of the professors I dealt with, you know, they loved it. They didn't want to leave. They wanted to spin it out and see stuff, but they loved what they were doing. So I think it's really a, it's a Pareto. It, it, really what it comes down to is the individuals you're dealing with um, within academia, where they want to go with that capability and technology. And if they want to have it out in the market and release, regardless of how that is, you know, there's a path forward. And then, like for me personally, it's just matching that up. Okay, does your path match what I want to do? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, right? But there's usually a path forward in taking that technology out uh, and making it commercially viable. Dennis Prather, I want to ask you, and, and uh, Sean Wang as well, um, the students that are in your classes today, these days, are they the types who are scientists in a business person's body or whatever that Jeff was just talking about? Do they have baked into their personas as engineers, the idea that they can also be a business, that what they're doing can be involved in a business, or is that something you actually have to expose them to and do you, how do you do that? How do you get students to realize there's this other opportunity, this other avenue for them? So, so I think you, th you see a mix, I think. Uh, you know, I see some that you know, want to you know, computer problems at the 10th decimal place, and others that are more interested in transitioning it to the first decimal place and getting it to a market. Uh, from, for me, it, it starts really early on. That's one of the unique things. I, I always volunteer for these Delaware Decision Days when the uh, uh, 11th and 12th graders are coming in because I really like to hit them with this message because it all starts as early as you possibly can to get people thinking about where they're going. 
uh, and, and how to get there. And the, the thing that's really unique about Delaware is that it, 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 we incorporate undergraduates into research. I went to Maryland, which, which is a school of like 50 some thousand people, and I never even saw my professor, much less my TA, much less had a chance to work in a lab. So in the last couple of years, we've been really uh, surprised, to be quite honest with you. We've had teams of undergraduates working in my lab and working, frankly, with our companies uh, to develop projects and products. And I, I remember I was almost emotional about it uh, a month or so ago when I looked at them, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and I said, look, I don't see you as students anymore. I see you as colleagues. And the truth is, they, they became engineers before my very eyes. Uh, it's one thing to solve homework problems and to study for exams. Another thing to take a problem that somebody just throws at you, and you have to figure out how to make it work, and it was it was it was a, you know a growing process, but uh, it was fun. And in the end of the day, I, I just couldn't believe how good they were. You and said you see your students as colleagues. I said I saw those students those as students colleagues. As colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. not all students are colleagues. Right, gotcha. <laughs> Some are. All right. Okay. So yeah. Uh, and just uh, Dr. Wang, one more thought from you. Do you do, are the students that you encounter at the university? Uh, do they have that baked into them that they, they can envision the connection you were speaking about a few minutes ago to the customer who has a specific need? I think it's, uh, again, uh, it's a practice. So when you're talking about entrepreneurship, it's neither science nor art. It's a blend of you know, some kind of a, a, a craft. So it's, it's experience. And a little bit analysis, which is a science. And very important, it is some insight, which is art. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something which uh, you cannot just learn, but practice. And uh, I al always encourage them you know, to practice. And uh, the, the rule I'm using is called VIP rule, very simple. One is a vision. You want to do something, you have to have a vision. It's critical. And so it's a kind of top down. But most importantly is I, is insight. You really have to develop some insight, okay? Understand a niche, understand exactly what kind of solutions people is looking for and what can you offer. And of course, the P is a plan, and you have to have a plan, so it's called VIP. <laughs> All right, now it's gonna be your turn to ask questions. I'm gonna to toss this out, or actually, Dr. Asanas, do you wanna to toss the microphone out to the audience? Uh, <laughs> so you gotta catch it and ask a question. I'm going to suggest to you, because you don't know this, but I do, Senator Coons has to leave in a few minutes to catch a train, so there's no, no uh, <laughs> flexibility in the schedule. So if it, is there someone who has a question for, uh, for Senator Coons? Raise your hand. Dr. Asanas will toss you the microphone, and you can ask away, fire away. Question for Senator Coons. All right. <laughs> Well, that was a good toss. Nice. You don't have, you don't have to hold it. You don't have to hold it tight. Good to I'm see the picture you, for our softball team. <laughs> good to That's see you, good. Senator. <laughs> With all the discussions in Washington about reducing uh, funding for basic research uh, and and the impact not just on the university but also on the long-term economy of our country, uh, my feeling is that we're kind of eating the seed corn if we do that. If we reduce investment into research that could lead to these companies that could lead. Uh, to the next economic revolution. I was interested in your take on, on what we can do to make the case of why this is important. Um, thank you for the question. I, I think your question is, how do we best make the case that continued federal investment in fundamental science, uh, as well as in dozens of other areas, uh, is important? Uh, we've been somewhat teasing uh, in my office that someone in the Trump administration budget office has figured out exactly what my top 20 priorities are in the entire federal budget and picked them out to be eliminated. Um, so um, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, um, funding for uh, community financial development institutions, Manufacturing USA, it's striking the constellation of things that I think are great ideas that in this budget the administration is eliminating. Uh, from foreign assistance to manufacturing work here at home. Um, under real threat uh, are programs within the Department of Commerce and within the Department of Energy that are essential to basic science and translational work. The March for Science, in my view, um, was an important uh, demonstration that um, there are scientists throughout our country who recognize that it's not enough to just publish uh, or to do research, that the very idea of the scientific method is under assault, 
and that the politicization of science um, and now an assault on the funding for science has taken on um, a whole new uh, degree of urgency. Um, one of the annual awards that I um, support in Washington by sometimes going and speaking, but that is, is worth maybe a minute of your time, is the Golden Goose Awards. Some of you may be familiar with former Senator Fulbright, um, who did a number of great things, Fulbright scholars not least among them. Wait a minute, you're choosing to bring the word goose back into the conversation? I am. Okay, good. <laughs> Just want to make, make that clear. But one of uh, Senator Fulbright's less attractive hobbies uh, was the annual Golden Fleece Award, where he would take federally funded research and mock it uh, by lifting it up and claiming that it was a complete waste of money. Uh, money spent on studying the sex life of the fruit fly or adhesive properties of geckos, feet, or things like that. Um, the Golden Goose Awards, which now is, has been going on for several years, takes similarly silly sounding federally funded abstract research topics and celebrates their translation into meaningful commercial application. Um, and it's an annual event. I hope folks from the University of Delaware are following it and maybe applying for it. But one of the things it helps make clear is that the process of um, iterative discovery um, really is not linear. And that um, just because there's federal funding for a topic over here doesn't mean that it is without application. Often the ultimate highly valuable commercial application is over here. It's a hard case to make, frankly. Um, because there are very few scientists in Congress. As best I can tell, out of 100 senators, there's only five with any real training in hard science. Um, and the enthusiasm for funding basic science is limited, except in cases where it has a defense application. Um, so this is something that, frankly, needs your voice um, and needs more engagement from the community of scientists, who are typically folks reticent um, from engaging in public discourse. Um, but there's a group of us, both Republicans and Democrats, um, who see the applications uh, and who see the value. Um, I wish we were talking about the value to humanity of discovery, period, without having to talk about applications. But in the short term, where I think we're going to have a very difficult budget cycle, um, we tend to talk about curing diseases and keeping our nation safe. So some of the applications you're talking about are ones that have direct application um, in keeping us safe. I'm um, keeping us amused, engaged, and deployed. Um, I talk fairly regularly about the discovery that allows you to do this on your iPhone, without which most of us wouldn't be able to now zoom in and engage with the apps that make our lives so much richer. Um, it's, it's important, though, to help folks in Congress and their staff realize um, the cumulative power of the investment in fundamental science and what a difference it's made in the average lives of Americans. So I do a fair amount of talking about things like GPS or even fracking um, that began in no small part through federal investment in applications that ultimately ended up in a very different place in life. Notice I picked one application that works for all political stripes and one that tends to appeal more to the right. So um, I think we have to be um, wide in our aperture in terms of talking about what are the investments in basic science that are of value, and how can we translate that into things that work for the average voter? OK, who's got another question for any of the panelists? Another question. All right, would you toss the microphone way in the back there in the far corner? You've got to catch it and use it. All right, way to go. Uh, who? Uh, it's working. Go ahead. Hi, Senator Kunz. It's nice to have you here. It's a pretty honor. Um, and uh, I think you have heard about what, uh, what kind of program, uh, what kind of department we are uh, in the University of Delaware. And uh, actually, among the programs in the University of Delaware, uh, electrical engineering and uh, maybe other engineering programs are pretty good, ranked. I'm uh, going to interrupt you right there and ask you to slow down your speech, please. I think the microphone is just garbling. From our perspective, it's a little hard to hear. Oh, so oh, just sorry, slow down and speak, speak a little more slowly, please. Oh, yeah. So. Um, so I think um, the, the electrical engineering has been a very successful program uh, in the University of Delaware. And uh, so my question is, um, what's a, uh, what, uh, is there any plan uh, for the, uh, to support the program in the University of Delaware to keep it good, to keep uh, students getting a good career? Um, and uh, is there a plan in the state level in the, uh, in the government? 
All right, I think the question is, uh, is what it, do you have a plan for helping to support programs like the one that you're involved in at the University of Delaware mm -hmm. to attract good students and to attract good faculty and so on? Uh, yes, is that, pro is provide that, opportunities for the students uh, uh, for the, uh, who will graduate in the future. To attract good students who will graduate and, and become like the rest of you. Uh, uh, yes. it, <laughs> do you want to hear that from Dr. Asanis, or do you want to hear, maybe that's, you're the best okay. person, I think, to. Uh, or, uh, maybe, uh, okay. uh, I think uh, I hope uh, uh, Senator Coons. Uh, uh, I would appreciate it if you can. All right, you'd like to hear from Senator Coons. This will this will be the senator's last remark. He he does have to leave the stage. He's not insulting us. He's got another commitment. We're very grateful for his for him <laughs> having been here. Uh, a comment on supporting the University of Delaware from from your perspective, sir. Great to be with you, Al. Um, in terms of uh, creating broader fields of opportunity going forward. Um, first, continuing to fight for funding that is relevant uh, to the research that's being done here. Second, um, for the Department of Education to continue to make available um, student loans at the undergraduate and graduate level that help finance access to higher education. Um, it is the combination of grants to the institution for research and the availability of grants and loans um, to undergraduates and graduates that makes higher education accessible in this country. Again, I think we're heading in the wrong direction with an administration that is proposing slashing the Department of Education and some of its key um, higher education grant programs. Last, um, one of the things I've worked on now over several Congresses is a bipartisan bill that would literally grant a green card status to every graduate student in a STEM discipline um, so that we would not have the challenge where um, a significant number of those who come here for graduate work are not able to stay here to start companies, to start families, to contribute to our communities, but instead, after a certain number of years, are forced to go back to their countries of origin. I think that combination of um, open arms, uh, welcoming and recognizing the value of people who come to the United States from wherever within our country around the world, um, open data, making sure that we make accessible um, to the community that wants to work on scientific data, federally generated data, and then open funding that makes possible both grants um, and the opportunity to come to the university um, that are three of the key components of, of my work in this area uh, this year. Let me just last say that in terms of the translation from lab uh, to marketplace, the Horn Center for Entrepreneurship is making a significant contribution to a change both in the culture um, and in the capabilities here at the University of Delaware. Uh, and I'm thrilled to see how you're continuing um, to ramp up its um, integration into a wide range of departments here. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be with you. You'd be thrilled that uh, Eric Wall is in the audience, who was one of your students and came to my office and has done four years of wonderful work with me. This is his last week with me. Oh. Uh, and we've done three events together in Delaware today. Um, I'm grateful for the chance to be with you. If you'll forgive me, I have to get back to Washington. Let's say thanks to Senator Coons, and then we'll hear from President Asana. Be sure you leave your microphone. Dr. Asanis, maybe you want to comment for a minute on the student's question? So, absolutely. So first of all, I'd like to thank Senator Kuntz. We know how busy he is and what a great support and advocate has, he has been for science in this country. Let's just put this on here. OK. And then it won't be. There you go. OK. And uh, let me just add a little bit as to what the university is doing and what we will be doing to, to augment uh, uh, the kinds of uh, successes that we've had. So you heard from Senator Kuntz about uh, the Horn Program in Entrepreneurship. Uh, currently, this program has uh, started under the College of Business and Economics, and we've had probably impact on uh, 300 students or so. My goal is to make sure that uh, a program like the Horn Program of Entrepreneurship is available to all our undergraduate students. You know? So we have another 17,000 students to go, Obviously, we need to generate the resources and endowment to be able to support that vision. But to, 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 to be more precise, uh, uh, what I would like to see is multiple entry points uh, into creativity and entrepreneurship uh, from all kinds of colleges and schools uh, here at the university, because it is the way of the future. 70% of the millennials actually want to be an entrepreneur, uh, or at the minimum, be creative, because the kinds of companies like the Apples and the Facebooks uh, and the Amazons are currently mature companies. They don't necessarily 
qualify as a startup, but nonetheless, they're very creative and they're moving our economy forward. So this is absolutely important to do, and we, we have taken the steps to enable this. Uh, so we're creating the maker spaces and the curriculum and the facilities uh, through the various incubators around the campus that we have. Of course, a lot of you are familiar with the Del Delaware Technology Park. Uh, we have cut the ribbon not too long ago, last, uh, I think, December, uh, for Delaware Technology Park at STAR on the STAR campus. Uh, uh, we had some visitors today from other universities, and they commended us about the vision for our STAR campus and the kind of interdisciplinary environment that we have there, which does promote entrepreneurship and people working together from multiple disciplines. Uh, we have uh, partnered with DuPont to form Delaware Innovation Space Inc. And again, this is a, a great uh, enabler of the dream. You know, from 10,000 square feet of space we had uh, on the Star Campus, now we have access to another 120,000 uh, square feet of space. So obviously, we'd love to see more of the faculty and the students engage in that. Uh, and uh, the last thing I will say, as uh, the development of a graduate college that we very much uh, uh, look forward to, to enable the strategic plan and enable this interdisciplinary education and the connection with uh, the outcomes that we want, the innovation, the entrepreneurship. Uh, the graduate students are the lifeblood of research and innovation, and the University of Delaware is the engine for economic development in our state. So a great future forward. Uh, like uh, Senator Kuhn's, uh, I have to go on another assignment. Um, I'm really, really delighted to be here with you today. I want to thank everybody, uh, obviously our chair for the electrical and computer engineering department, our dean, Tunde Ogunaike, who is sitting right there for all your great contributions, and of course the faculty, the staff, and the students above all for all the wonderful things. Uh, great first 125 years, another 125 and beyond. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Asanas. I'm going to thank you. I'm going to ask for a final comment from each of the other remaining panelists. But in a minute, we're bringing on a group of three seniors, student, current students who are graduating seniors, who are in the middle of this same kind of process that you all went through at one point or other in your undergraduate education. But your final comment: We've heard a lot today from each of you, from Dr. Asanas, from Chris Coons, from, from the questioners, about the importance of interdisciplinarity. Maybe each of you could offer some advice to the students in the room about why that's valuable. What is it about breaking out of the shell of your discipline that propels entrepreneurs into the kinds of spaces that all of you are involved in? Jeff, do you want to take that first? Sure. Uh, it, it, it's fundamentally critical to be successful in any commercial venture. You have to have a, a, a cadre or a basket of skills, right? And so the more you can get exposed to those other areas, even if you don't become a domain expert there, you now appreciate what that person does, why they do it, and, and the value that they can bring to you. So I think it just accelerates the whole process and opens up your mind. It's like standing at a house and looking out a different window. You know, you just, you're in the same house, but you're looking out a different window. And I think it's, just, it's pivotal to make sure that that occurs in the success of a business. So the earlier you can get that exposure um, uh, in, your, in your maturation into business or into, into your life's work, and the, I think the more successful you'll be and the more opportunities you'll be able to pick from. If you want to shift gears and go to another discipline, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I see somebody who spends a whole uh, you know, uh, uh, slew of years in, in, in the academic world getting degrees and then saying, you know, what I really like to do is this. And they take what they learned here and bring it over here, but it wasn't until much later. If you can find that out early in life, I tell my children, you know, you're going to be around 100 years. My kids, I hopefully will be. I said, find something you like to do and, and, and be passionate about it. Dr. Prather, do you want to comment on that interdisciplinarity aspect, both perhaps from a student as well as from a faculty point of view? Yeah, well, I think it's essential uh, to any type of success, academic, entrepreneurial, even personal, frankly. Uh, I, I, I take a lot of pride in not being the smartest person in the room. I, I, I am very fortunate to work with a lot of incredibly diverse and talented people. And, and I can tell you this, I came to the university 20 years ago and I had my focus on my research and that was what I was gonna do and I didn't see beyond it. And I'm doing things today and I've been doing things for the last 10 years that I never even knew existed. 
And it's because of the diversity that that even became an opportunity for us. Uh, you know, having people present ideas that are completely something different than I would have ever thought of it and of myself. And, and, and diversity is key, but you also have to create an environment where diversity can thrive. So the first thing you have to, in my perspective, is give them security and let them know that they're going to have uh, the resources to provide for their family and, uh, and to do the things that they need to do and want to do. And then you have to give them an environment where they feel that they can be empowered to be successful. Right? And the third thing you have to do is give them essentially the, the personal uh, feedback that they're appreciated, uh, they're respected, and, and, and in a lot of cases, frankly, they're, they're admired. And I think, if, and if you do that on a genuine level, I think diversity just becomes the engine for all kinds of amazing things. And, and, and the, the end, end result is just it's an amazing amount of fun. All right, uh, Dr. Wong, final word in this panel. I agree with the uh, two panelists. Uh, my experience is, I think the uh, biggest obstacle for me to grow is the realization I don't know, I don't know. So that's the key. And it, uh, especially for a high-tech entrepreneur, to certain levels, we have to grow and then migrating from so-called technical expert to the level of manager. So I think you know, that's, that those are uh, two points, and it, uh, I think uh, critical to me. So. All right. Let's say thanks, please, to Jeff White, Dennis Prather, and Sean Wong for their participation. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it a lot. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Gentlemen, come on out. All right, we're going to bring on another panel that you'll be really interested to hear from. <clears throat> Just fill in here. Let's leave the. Yeah, right. Come on over here. Good. Thank you. A little quick transition here. Uh, all three of the gentlemen on, your sta on the stage right now are graduating seniors from the University of Delaware, and uh, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, by their majors, but I want to say that this is, I, I asked the last question of our last panel with a reason. Uh, sitting to my right is Keith Doggett, who's an electrical and computer engineering honors student. Uh, next is Jason Bamford, who's in biomedical engineering. And uh, at that end is Jordan Gonzalez, who is a finance student, an honors finance student. And so on this stage right now, you have an interdisciplinary group of students who are involved in entrepreneurship. And one of you has got to tell me, maybe Keith can tell us, what is it that you're entre entrepreneuring in? What are you doing? Yeah. Um, I mean, do you want to do it? Who? Yeah, sure. Well, do, you do it. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Am I on? All right. You're I'm on. on. All right. Yeah, so we created GeoSwap. So basically, it aggregates everything going on in an area. So it's a what, mobile application. Wait a minute. What uh, GeoSwap is a mobile application? Yes. Okay. Yeah, mobile application. Application. So you can download it on your phone, uh, and it aggregates everything going on. So that's events, deals, information, landmarks, points of interest, happy hours uh, for the students in the audience. Um, but for businesses, it allows them to create these points really easily. So they pop up a spot on the map. Everyone in the area will know about it. And then that business can get really interesting analytics on top of that. So as opposed to getting like likes or clicks on Facebook, these businesses will actually know how many people view their information from afar and then actually convert and then go into their store. So you're getting foot traffic, in-store conversions, as opposed to just likes or clicks on the internet. OK. You developed, the, the three of you developed this app? Mostly. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I, I am a finance major. I am not very technical. I do front end design. I can draw something and then it will slide the sheet over to Keith and say, how much of this can we actually build? And that's, that's what happened. What do you mean by front end design? So there are two different times. Uh, you have front end design, which is basically what makes something look nice, and then the back end, which actually makes it work. So all I do is I make mock-ups, I'll draw something, I'll mock it up on the computer, and then what I do is I bring it over to Keith and another friend of ours, Riley, who actually do the building, the, the coding behind it, to, to develop it. And it's just when we work it out and say, okay, how much can we actually make? Okay, and Jordan, is, is front end design, as you just described it, is there a course in front-end design in the finance school, <laughs> the finance uh, department here at the University of Delaware? There is currently not, but I feel like it should be. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, but that's part of being an entrepreneur. You know, we, we all follow different, uh, we all have different desires. We try different things. And even though the three of us all have things that we focus on more than other things, we all wear multiple hats and we're all doing different things. Okay. Keith, what's your, what's your job in this? I do a lot of the development. Uh, I help with sales and marketing. We all kind of split 
that, um, but the main thing that I specialize in would be the development, um, building a lot of the application uh, in terms of the back end and front end. Um, yeah, so mainly that uh, is what I specialize in, but we do everything. Okay, so now I, I'm trying to get a picture of this in my head. Mm -hmm. yep. You go to class in the daytime, and you're biomedical and you're in biomedical uh, engineering, uh, and um, and or Keith, you're electrical okay. and computer, and Jason, you're biomedical. Mm -hmm. After you do your biomedical stuff during the day, and you come home and you write your paper for the next day or whatever project you have to do with yep. that, what does that have to do with GeoSwap? Not what, much. But what, I'm getting, <laughs> what I want to get at, though, is what is it about what you're studying sure. that propelled you to, made those light bulbs come on that say, hey, we can do this. And, yeah. and not only that, but I have the ability to do this part of it, and you have the ability to do that other part of it. Sure. How did sure. that come about? So all of our courses, they really just teach you about solving problems, and they bring up problems in the world around you, and they help you, you can solve them and give you those skills to solve them. Um, so even though our classes might be aligned with like organic chemistry or um, like something electrical, the ability to solve the problems and bring it into GeoSwap, I mean, it happens all the time for us. So you, you, you actually find the problems in your classes that you solve in GeoSwap? Yeah, I mean, we, I, mean I know it, it's kind of unrelated, but we took Python in freshman year, and I use that all the time for GeoSwap. <laughs> What's Python? Uh, it's a programming language. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Fine. I mean, Got the, it. The, the, all, of, all of our classes, um, yeah. you could, there's always something to take away from it. And mm -hmm. the biggest thing, and also what the Horn program goes over, it's just that you're solving a problem. So while we may not be solving the problems that we were shown in class, mm -hmm. we were taught how to take the constraints that you're given and take the assets that you have to then solve problems. And so we yeah. just applied it to a problem that, as college students, we saw every day. Yeah. And I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've been in class where we'll do the whole problem go the whole semester and then be like, yeah, if you actually want to do this, you'd put it into a computer and that would just figure out the answer for you. So a lot of what you actually learn is more just to understand how things work and how to go about solving those problems instead of actually applying necessarily directly what you were taught in class. It's more understanding how all the things around you work. All right, you have to forgive me. I'm asking some what must seem like stupid questions to you, but Fine. I'm looking at it from the outside. Uh, are all of you, were all of you friends before you started working on GeoSwap? Yep. Yeah. So you already knew each other. You had a team. I'm coming back to uh, Dr. Prather's comment about team, the value of the team. The team was already in existence, unrelated to your majors, unrelated to your classwork particularly. Mm -hmm. You had that going for you. Um, did you, how, tell us, how, how did you figure out doing GeoSwap? I mean, was it, is, it, is this a problem that needs solving? Sure. Well, originally, it just started about a year and a half ago, going into my junior year, like the, during that summer. And it kind of started with just this idea of this technology of unlocking digital content in physical locations. So it wasn't what GeoSwap is today. It was just this neat idea that was kind of bubbling around in our heads, oh, my, my head particularly, um, about how to get digital information when you arrive at physical locations. Uh, so if we thought it'd be cool, you, know, you go to the restaurant, you get the coupon on your phone, you go to a landmark, uh, and you get the information that's relevant to it right when you walk in. You go to the mall, all the information that's relevant to that location is right there in front of you at your fingertips. And we were, I wasn't really sure how it was going to all come together or what this was actually going to look like. Um, and then we got brought into the Horn program. They brought us to a lot of customer discovery. Uh, Vince DeFelice was a big influence on us, really helped us out. And then Keith and Jordan both joined on the team, and they kind of really molded GeoSwap into what it is today. So the Horn program, which is part of the University of Delaware, was instrumental, you would say, in helping oh. you gel the concept and figure out what next steps were. What do you mean by customer discovery? Yeah, so customer discovery is when you actually go out and talk to the customer. So a lot of times, as an engineer, you're kind of just, this is so cool, let me just build it, build it, build it, build it, build it, build it, and you go out in the world and nobody wants what you have. Uh, so with, with, with customer discovery, what you're supposed to do is supposed to talk to the end user and ask them, like, what do, you want to see? what do you see in this? What are your problems? Tell me about your problems. And you take that information, you go back to your, what your product is and kind of mold it and craft it so that it actually fits what the customer is looking for. Yeah. And did Go ahead. Oh, I was just, the way that we think about it is like we're always in a constant, st 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 wow, constant state of beta. Like you're never fully done with what you're doing. I mean, there's always something that you're doing where you might be spending too much time on something that people don't really care about, and you're not spending enough time on something that people really do. You want to build something that people really love and then scale that up. So the, the real goal is to always be in the face of the people who are using it, because you can't create a great solution in a vacuum. It just doesn't happen. All right, now, I think it's fair to say, I'm not sure everybody in the audience knows this, but 
but it's fair to say you guys have already won some awards and some recognition for GeoSwap. So it's not as though people have looked at GeoSwap and said, meh, <laughs> you know, somebody's looked at it and said, yeah, this could be useful. How did you go about at your young age figuring out uh, which customers to explore, explore this with? I mean, who do you ask? Uh, do you want people to have a coupon when you walk through the door? I mean, is that, <laughs> yeah. how, how did you do that? I mean, we kind of talked to everybody. Uh, over the summer, we were all working on it, and just every day we'd be, uh, like in Wilmington or in Newark, we'd spend about half the day just meeting with people and talking to them um, and try to figure out who was most interested. Everyone had different ideas, uh, and it was really about who was going to act on it first. Um, and that's kind of how that guided uh, the direction we were going. But yeah, it was just talking to people all day pretty much. And I can't help inter interjecting here that that doesn't sound like computer engineering to me, <laughs> or biomedical engineering, you know, or, f well, maybe it's cl something involved in finance. But uh, again, the point is you reached beyond your designated major or your designated area of interest or even your designated personal interest in developing this app, you reached out into areas that maybe you were not so comfortable at, interviewing strangers to ask them what they would want. And did you ever fear that they might say, no, you know, I'm not real, this doesn't appeal to me. Did you ever confront that and say, well, let's go back to square one and figure something else out? It's always a fear that you have, but the the thing the reason why you do it is because if you when you have the education you realize that an even bigger fear that you should have is if you ask the question you don't get the right answer or and you start working on it anyway and then about a year and a half in the future after spinning your wheels and doing all of this then you realize okay they don't even want what i'm building so you'd rather get a no that's honest than hear a yes that isn't honest because I can get anybody in this room right now to answer a question the way that I want them to. If I say like, wouldn't it be so cool if when you showed up to a building you got all the information about it? Like everybody would be like, oh, yeah, that's, that sounds pretty interesting. But it doesn't tell me really anything. It doesn't tell me if it's something that they download. So I'd have to really ask really specific unbiased questions of, you know, what are your problems with, um, with engaging with your community? It's a, that, that can go in a million different directions and I'm not guiding them anyway. And that's, that's really how you pull out a good solution. You, you be very general and let them uh, get specific. Now, you mentioned the HORN program a moment ago. Are there, um, were there faculty members either there or maybe in your other uh, disciplines, for all I know, who heard about this project as you talked with them about it, who gave you ideas or gave you encouragement or maybe told you to forget about it or whatever? Uh, what other inputs have you had from the academic environment here that have affected the outcome of your of your project? Well, shout out to Vince, who's actually in the seats right over there. Yeah, I see you, Vince. Um, <laughs> Vince has been incredibly uh, influential. He works with a lot of the uh, the ventures, uh, the businesses that are in the Horn program. You know, he's done. Uh, he's had a number of successful businesses, and what he also says, a number of not so successful businesses. But that's all. I mean, you learn a lot from all of that, and he's been incredibly helpful because he's always ducking in and giving us advice. We're always ducking in his room and giving advice. I mean, the Horn program itself tries to connect you with advice the Summer Founders Program, which was something that we were a part of, where that's actually where the three of us met, mm -hmm. um, all decided to start working on GeoSwap, because Keith and I were working on a separate business before we joined up with Jason. Um, that program itself gave us advisors that we still use to this day. Mm -hmm. We have Steve Friedman, who has 25 years in enterprise sales, and John Drastel, who <laughs> Um, worked on Wall Street, had over a billion dollars under management, um, and also had a computer science degree. So, I mean, we have a, a really wide breadth of advisors that were afforded to us because we're involved in the Horn program. Yeah, and the whole College of Engineering also has been super supportive the entire way, and they helped set up that proof of concept fund, um, which we're a part of that helped us uh, over the winter. Um, we kind of secured that, yep. and that's really been instrumental in moving forward uh, as well. What do you spend that money on? So it all depends what kind of what stage we're at. Um, so before, like, so we got the iCorp grant too from NHF, uh, NHF, yeah, NHS, F, whatever, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was great. And then we spent that on a little bit of development in tech, so we, we, we can kind of scale our product at that point. Uh, some of it went to customer discovery, uh, going to conferences, meeting people so that we can meet more people, um, s stuff like that. And one more thing I also want to shout out, because mm -hmm. I forgot, Andy Novus, and you were yeah. also very helpful. Yes, yes. He's, he's a little yes. bit more okay with getting stuff done. We were, we, um, we were the, so as an event app and yeah. also as attractions, we were the official event app for, and, um, for 
SantaCon NYC, which if you guys aren't aware of that, um, then you guys got to get out more. Um, but <laughs> it was, um, uh, it's, a, it's a great bar, like it's a bar crawl where everybody, or all these people, 5,000 people go to New York City dressed up as Santa Claus to get drunk in the Empire State. So it's awesome. And as the official event app for it, we had uh, just an insane amount of downloads, at least at that time, in one shot. We had 600 downloads in less than 12 hours because they sent out a couple tweets and the app immediately broke so <laughs> we were, so yeah. we were like all right what do we do we yeah. were looking through all of yeah. it and you know keith and jason were speaking with andy yeah. Andy was helping us out with mm -hmm. how to how to solve that problem yeah. so he was also really helpful we appreciate so it so that's a good example of the problem of scale mm -hmm. it's one thing to do it on a lab bench or the equivalent of a lab bench that you guys were working on um, and it's another thing to become commercially successful where it's so successful that it breaks mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> is, is that a is that a tough is that a tough experience to go through? Yeah, I spent uh, eight <laughs> hours on the phone with Amazon uh, that day, so that was a little tough personally for me. Um, but yeah, definitely. Because, uh, because they were hosting yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, so that was a little bit of a tough one, um, but eventually got to the bottom of it. But definitely, it was a good learning experience, um, for sure, is having something like that. Like, you don't want to see that happen, but you, you know, we all learned from it. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Won't happen again. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully, uh, that, you know, we figured that problem out, and hopefully if something, when something like that happens again, we can be a little more prepared. And Keith's not giving himself enough credit, because he was on the phone for eight hours with Amazon, <laughs> but then he was like, all right, these, these the guys, as, as, uh, as Vince would say, aren't helping me out at all, so he hung up the phone and then figured it out himself. <laughs> so, really impressive. So I'm gonna call out a lesson from what you've just talked about that maybe or maybe not you, you recognize, and that is that you can't know everything. And nobody can know everything. No matter how old you are, you don't know everything. And Dr. Wang said a few minutes ago, uh, you gotta know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think what you just described was that experience of, well, we didn't know that we didn't know how to deal with that problem. Mm -hmm. Now we know we have to figure out how to deal with that problem. And that's something that will apply not just to this app, but perhaps to some other project that you decide to work on in the future. All right, now I'm gonna play the role of the snotty, nasty journalist <laughs> who's uh, got you know, this bad attitude about everything, right? And so I'm gonna ask you, so you've got this app that when I walk down Main Street past the bar, it's gonna pop up and it's gonna say, come inside for a, a, a $2 beer or whatever it is, and I'm gonna say, wow, that's really cool, and I'm gonna go in and become a customer of that bar. The bar is gonna thank you, they're gonna pay you, probably, I, I don't know how that works, but I presume you get some kind of a kickback from them. Uh, I'm gonna get the $2 beer, and you're gonna get the feeling of success. So you're in this for the money, right? I mean, the goal, really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, honestly, I wasn't sure exactly how to respond to that. Um, so, I mean, the goal is to really actually engage communities, to really build them up. There's a big Main Street push mm -hmm. um, all across the country because uh, we're not engaging with our communities the way that we used to. Uh, the research has actually improved it. Um, the Journal of Extension uh, is one of the jur uh, pr premier journals that actually researches that. And they've proven that the biggest barrier to uh, engagement in communities is a lack of awareness and lack of knowledge. You know, you can't enjoy something in your community if you don't know what's happening. And a lot of us deal with that problem. I mean, we have social media and we're all supposed to be more connected than ever, but I can't probably reach out to any of you in, uh, in this room right now because I don't happen to have the exact connection to you. So we wanted to try to connect the community to each other. We wanted to put the, the most relevant people, the people who are around you, in front of you. And so that's really the goal, to make it so that the communities are really connecting with each other. It sounds a little like GeoSquare or whatever. Or Foursquare? <laughs> what is it? Foursquare? Foursquare, yeah. Well, the thing is that people don't use Foursquare anymore. Because <laughs> they don't. They because don't. why? Because their developers didn't develop it the way you guys are developing GeoSwap? It wasn't, it wasn't built to, to really to serve a user's purpose. The, the goal of the app was for you to check in and let other people know, like, hey, I'm here if they happen to be looking at it. But... That's not really what keep, like people don't want to just tell a business, hey, I'm here just so that you know, there's no really value from, to me for telling you that and there's no real, I mean, so people don't use that. But what we wanted to do was create something that gave you value. You're, you're looking for things to do. You're looking for reasons to actually go outside and we're just basically giving you those. We built an ad platform that shows you ads, but they're not, they're not ads the same way you see them on Facebook because if you get, a, if you get uh, say for Grotto's sake, you get an ad from Grotto's saying that there's a $2 beer. You don't care, you actually don't want to see that. But if you're walking by Grotto's and you see that because you're looking for something to do, then it's not even an ad in your, in your eyes. It's actually something that's valuable. So we kind of tried to change the way that you see ads and give it so that it's user-focused. 
Now, none of you has mentioned this yet, and I sort of thought you might, so, but I'm going to ask about it. You recently uh, signed a deal with the state of Delaware, I think, mm -hmm. with an agency of the state of Delaware, to deal with uh, effectively tourism at the Delaware State parks and other attractions around the state. Somebody tell me, what, what's that about? I mean, what, what does that do? How is that different from what you've just been talking about in terms of coupons for commercial institutions and things like that? Yeah, so it kind of puts it on the app for us. So it puts a ton of information. So when you, right when you open it, there's a ton of things that you could do. So it really goes beyond just coupons and little deals. It's activities. It's a way to get active in your community. And by integrating with the DTO, the tourism office, and the parks, uh, it really gives us a ton of great content. And it's all up to date, so we integrate it with all their APIs. So we update it like once a day, and it comes right onto GeoSwap. So as soon as you open it up, there's a ton of different pins all throughout the state that you can go and enjoy. Okay, so there is a case where you're you're connecting to content created by somebody else, yes. mm -hmm. and then GeoSwap simply uh, funnels it through to the user who's expressing an interest by clicking on whatever they're clicking in yep. to say they're interested in going out for a bike ride or something like that, right? Yep, yep, and they get a lot of great analytics on it too. So, they so can get... do you, are you paying the state for that content? Or is the state paying you for the ability to distribute the content, or how does that work? That's the best part. Mm. We're not, we're <laughs> Tell not, us um, the best part. Uh, yeah. yeah, so they're paying us to put this content um, in, in, uh, in the app where people are actually going to it because they want to get more young people like us on it, and they know that every single person carries a phone, so that's the easiest way to get it. And the thing is, they've already created all this content, but nobody's finding it. When we actually gave the pitch to the state uh, parks, the, they gave us something that was really interesting. They told us that they have a World War II veteran who did, um, a vi did videos at all of the different, a lot of the different spots where there were battles fought um, from in Delaware, but that guy recently died. And if you wanted to find those videos, you'd have to go through like 30 different pages just to find those. And you're not doing that when you're on your phone. You're not even doing that when you're on your computer. But what we do is we're going to be able to put that same information at that spot. So there's zero searching involved. Once you're there, it's automatically there for you to see. So all of this information that they've already spent all this money to create, now people are actually going to be able to access it and get a better experience. So that's what they're really paying us for. Okay. Now, we've been talking about GeoSwap. I think everybody in the audience now knows what it is and how you envision using it. What if it's a flop? What if you put it out there and it becomes four square? That is, eh, nobody's using it that much. Uh, the question I really want to ask you is, have you thought your, yourselves through as a team in terms of, okay, this is this project, we'll do the best we can, we, hopefully it'll be a blockbuster, we have every expectation it will be, but what happens if it isn't? Do you throw up your arms and say, eh, never mind, that was, that was fun, and move on? Or have you thought about that at all? Yeah, I mean, going into this, like, just statistically, we, you know, wouldn't expect to succeed. Uh, that's just kind of what happens. But, I mean, it's an opportunity. We're saying that we're going to do this. We have about nine months of runway, and we're going to say that, at the very least, even if, if this does fail, we're gaining something from it. Um, as long as that's always the way we're viewing it, then there's no... It's not like we're going to be poor on the street. Like we hate, we're going to be able to sustain ourselves from it. So it's not like we're, we've decided that the risk of failure doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it um, because we'll be gaining something from it no matter what. What do you mean by nine months of runway? Um, yeah, so, yeah, about. we were able to get um, some between the money that we were won from competition, sales, and then some other investment from some people in Delaware. Uh, we have enough money to pretty much go for nine months. Okay. And so you guys are all graduating now, right? Mm -hmm. Are you going to grad school? You're doing, what are you doing right after you graduate? You're full time. Full time. Full time geo swap. Yeah, we have an office. The 1313. Oh. Okay. All right. And so you've sort of set yourself an unofficial timeline of nine months, let's say maybe a year, to figure out whether this is really going someplace. Ideally, nine months from now, you've either been, what, bought out by somebody else or we don't plan on that happening in nine months mm -hmm. but the goal is to have one of two well one of three things ha um, potentially happening at that point we are either growing at the rate where revenues will sustain us so that we don't have to raise any more money uh, we're growing at the point where revenue is totally worth it and will uh, and uh, where That's revenue right. yeah where revenue is decent but we still can't grow at the speed that we want to so we'll raise more money so that we can continue going or the app will have failed and we'll be able to cut it and either work on something else because we have a great team or um, get our own jobs because the three of us are incredibly smart and awesome people. And by the way, that is very apparent. By we the did, way. we did, we are, we are raising our money, uh, raising funds, but we haven't closed out our two hundred thousand dollars. So if anybody in this room happens to be connected to money in any way, 
And there's the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. All right, have now I want to ask you, uh, we, we're going to take some questions from the audience here in a second, but I want to ask, so get that uh, microphone ready, whoever's got it. Um, but I want to ask you this. Clearly, it's not always smooth sailing. I mean, you told us one story about how technically there was a failure, and that's, but there are other ways to fail as well. There are other obstacles, even if they aren't failures. There's obstacles to getting people to know about the product and so on and so forth. What's the, what's the, what are your biggest challenges right now at this stage of your development? Uh, how many downloads have you had, for example? Uh, so right now, we're at around 3,000 downloads. Um, but some of the biggest problems that we have are um, well, we, we always want to get more people to know about the app. The one way that we're solving that is as an app that actually can be used for events, we've been able to drive downloads by being the official event app of an event because then a mass of people all in one area have a very strong reason to download it. Um, the other thing that's, uh, that's a struggle is you know, just quickly iterating on what we're getting information about. That's what the lean methodology out of the Horn program really teaches you. Um, and engineering, you know, it's like you, you go, you get feedback, and then you immediately change it, get more feedback, change it, and so we want to try to do that as fast as possible. Keith and Riley have been doing a great job, but you know, as students who also have schoolwork and who has to sleep at some point, I guess, um, <laughs> like you know, you can't iterate as fast as you'd like, but we are doing a, a good job of keeping up with it. So you're connecting with funders at the moment, but you're also connect, trying to raise money by through sales, mm -hmm. effectively, right? What about content? Do, do you, is one of you kind of beating the bushes for the next parks and tourism site, maybe in another state or something like that? I mean, yeah. how, are you handling, how can you handle all that with, with three people? Yeah, we're, we're trying our best. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we all kind of divide and conquer, so we just actually went to a convention out in Pittsburgh where we got connected with Main Streets all across the country, uh, so that was a big benefit to us. Um, the parks, it is a partnership with us, so they're going to help us reach out to other organizations in perhaps neighboring states, uh, and they, they, they told us that, so that was helpful for us. Yeah. So we're, all, we're, we're working a bunch of different channels. Yeah, and the tourism and the, and the, the press that we got from the partnership mm -hmm. has been very helpful. We've actually been reached out to by a couple of different uh, larger organizations. Like, when we haven't closed anything yet, but the Delaware International Speedway has reached out to us because they want to put their pins on the map. Um, Southern Delaware's Tourism Board, they reached out to us because they want to put their pin on the map. So it's the ability to, to leverage what we have to get more information because they see that the more users that are brought on the more value everybody has so it's uh, you mentioned I have a question for you Keith in a yeah. second but you you, you mentioned uh, a minute ago um, uh, you want you, you like the idea of having massive numbers of people in a place who are at an event and then they their downloads take off and and so on uh, are you targeting things like I don't know NASCAR or even UD's alumni weekend or something where thousands of people get together for a particular event, limited time frame, uh, do you think about how do, how do you uh, include that event in your system, even though in two weeks or three weeks it'll be gone, it's, it's over until next year or whatever, but uh, is that something you can tackle with just three of you? I mean, yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, that's, well, also, we are trying to work with the school more, so if any of you have connections to, this, to the school, <laughs> we can work with the okay. school. But, yeah, it's those, it's those, those big events that are actually very useful for us because we can generate a lot of downloads, but the reason that we're trying to build out an entire community is because people then won't delete the app after they leave because there's a greater use to it. Okay. And, Keith, I wanted to ask you, yep. others have talked about uh, various challenges, but technologically, what do you see as the next thing? I mean, aside from... Aside from iterating, which you've, which you've all talked about, but is there something in the back of your head which you either may or may not want to reveal, but is there something that you've thought about They said, you know, what we could really do with this is blah, 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 and are you kind of working on that on the side? Is that something you have to do to leapfrog the technology, or do you just do you stay where you are, get it as good as it can be, and so on? I mean, right now we're definitely trying to build out what we have and make that as good as possible. But uh, personally, I'm interested in some of the near field technology that is getting implemented in phones now. My scene design was on RFID um, communication, so I'm a little familiar with that. Um, I think that could be really valuable for what we're trying to do and make it a little more passive for the user. Um, and you know, that's definitely down the road, but. Uh, something implemented with that near field communication technology would be cool for sure. Okay, and last question from me and then questions from you. Uh, and you'll forgive me, old guy, white hair, you know, not that interested in the beer coupon. Um, <laughs> but I can imagine a technology like this being useful in other ways. For example, in a security situation, you, go, you travel to a different city, a, a strange city perhaps in the United States or abroad, and uh, you are 
you know, you're a young woman who's walking down the street and you want to know, is this a good place for me to be walking after 8 p.m. or something like that? Uh, or you are in the military and you're deployed someplace abroad. Uh, and of course, you get a lot of support from your military unit and from the Defense Department and so on. But have you thought about other ways to make use of this mm -hmm. technology that do not involve uh, necessarily entertainment, but perhaps other aspects of people's lives? Yeah, absolutely. We actually applied to a DHS grant uh, a couple months ago with a Department group. Department of, of Homeland Security. Yes, okay. yeah, for their emergency response team specifically. Um, so imagine like a fire, um, a fireman or a police officer or the SWAT team knowing all the information when they arrive at a location and being able to communicate with everyone securely at that location. So that was kind of what it was around. Uh, we applied with a couple other companies down in Wilmington. So it's definitely a direction we're looking to go uh, kind of as a technology company as opposed to just a single app. Anybody else want to cut? Bob, there's also the possibility of construction. We were also talking about that at specific, um, at specific um, construction sites. All that information doesn't have to get transferred with papers and all, um, having uh, the secure um, clipboards that you need. You know, it could all just be in the cloud, accessible right when you get there. Okay. Yeah. Gentlemen, thanks. Uh, questions from the audience. We have one over here. Who's got the microphone? Uh, what? Hang on a second. Just chuck it at him. <laughs> We'd rather you didn't, just because it might be being recorded. I don't know if it is actually, but I love that. Line. There you go. <laughs> All right. So, oh, that's uh, cool. Have you looked at who your competition is? I mean, there's other people doing this. Uh, have you guys looked at that angle yet to figure out how you can differentiate what you're doing versus, you know, what they're doing? Yeah. So there. Um, so we look at a couple different verticals as competition. So. First, you have just the marketing platforms, which especially at the, at the small community retail space is print advertising with like our flyers, newspapers, things that are very hard to actually keep track of um, in terms of analytics. Um, you have Facebook, which is useful for analytics because you can track exactly how many clicks and how many eyeballs are on it, but you can't track how many people then show up to your physical location as a result of that. And then you have the other vertical of, um, what was the other vertical? Um, of event apps. Mm -hmm. So the, thing, the problem with event apps is that they focus specifically on events and they're only for one particular event. So say that there was an event app specifically for this uh, event. You get all the information, but then once you leave, there's no reason to have it anymore. You're immediately gonna delete it. So you guys can't reach back out and re-engage that populace. So there are, there are things that do, um, that do parts of what we're doing and they do them well, but we're really trying to encompass all of it so that we can serve uh, a wider audience. And, and just to follow up on that, it's a very good question. Do you try to um, recreate that technology? Do you think about engaging with a competitor and saying, do you want to join us? H how do you mentally, how do you approach that? Do you say, oh, we can just rewrite the code for that. We don't need to talk to them. Eh, not, I mean, so what we've thought about in terms of further down the road in an acquisition type of strategy, that's where we would look to the market, um, to those marketing channels, which some, some people are using like the social medias of a Snapchat and a Facebook, especially because the two of them are right now fighting a very tough battle of when you show up to a location, whose app do you open when you pull out your phone? Because we're, because we're trying to be that, also that app, but in a different way by focusing on a very specific segment, it's actually a very good acquisition strategy. So that's kind of where we're looking to. If we're gonna build ourselves into anything, it would be more in those spaces. So. Mark Zuckerberg, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, question over here. Sure, hey guys. Um, I guess since I was in engineering school, folks have become a lot more smarter about intellectual property. So my question to you is, now that you guys have decided to start your own company and you have this nine month runway, um, I mean, there's a lot of development that seems like you're doing. W what steps are you taking to make sure that, uh, you know, you're, you're not only protecting yourself, but also making yourself look better depending upon what your out strategy is in terms of intellectual property? Yeah, intellectual property. Intellectual property yeah. protection. Good yeah, question. Good, good question. So we actually filed a provisional patent about a year and a half ago, a little more, uh, when the idea was just first bubbling in my head around the geo unlocking of digital content and physical locations and the engagement that provides. And then since then, we filed the full utility uh, on that. And we have a great patent attorney, uh, intellectual property attorney, up, up from Scranton, Pennsylvania, that we've been working with. Uh, he actually liked the idea so much and thought it was so novel that he, we ended up signing a deal that he did it at a discounted rate because at the time I didn't have any money. <laughs> How did you find that person? 
Good question. So I talked to a bunch of lawyers, uh, a lot of them, and I, he ended up being referred to me by another tech startup uh, in Scranton. I was working at a private equity company at the time, uh, so I was looking at a lot of different deals, uh, and I asked one of them, uh, who's, your, who's your lawyer, and they recommended him. Okay. Not, not, an, not a UD connection? It was not, no. Okay. No. I think UD, uh, I, I may be speaking out of turn here, I think UD has some expertise in that oh, area. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we, got, we got offered, as a result of winning Hatch a bunch of free uh, legal work. The thing was, he just he was in Scranton, so he got somebody from Scranton. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> I was just curious whether there was a UD connection yeah. at all. Right. Sorry, yes. the, the other, the other I'm part sorry. of that, though, is you know, it's fine that you're, you're seeking the protection, but then you know, you've got to worry about the landscape that, that you're in. Your competitors, mm -hmm. you know, if you guys get really good, yeah. they're going to want to come after you. So you've got to sort of make sure that that back door yeah. is also protected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Somebody want to toss it to him? Okay. We need you to toss that. Yeah. Oh. Let's see what type of arm you have. Uh, okay. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're not going to do the toss. Okay. Uh, right, right, right. Of course. Yes. Yeah. A little drop kick. <laughs> um, first, I just want to say congratulations. You guys are inspirational. And uh, as I was sitting here, I downloaded your app, so oh. 3001. Yeah. And Thank shout you. out because the ECE event is on it. <laughs> um, so I'm just very curious, you know, thinking about what the panelists said and understanding who your customer is. Uh, I see so many different applications for this, you know, from Firefly, you know, university settings, mm -hmm. communities. Who do you see as your primary customer right now? Like, what is your target audience? And then how are you going to diversify that and grow it down the road? Do you want to talk about the umbrella? Well, okay. when you say customer, uh, I mean, audience would be me just walking around with the app, right? But you're talking about customers in terms of who's going to hey. help Who's going to pay for the? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So right now uh, it's a lot of tourism kind of focused things. That's what we started with. That's the people who have been very responsive so far, who kind of have a lot of reach in the community already, and have all this information, but just want a better way to distribute it. Uh, that's what it's going to be at first, we think, uh, and then after that, it's going to be more moving into some of the more local businesses, uh, and then maybe like larger retailers or other. Um, I mean, we're going to see from there, but. Kind of, I think we're going to start with the bigger tourism industry or organizations because they've been super responsive. Yeah, what we've seen is that umbrella organizations are very useful for us getting access to either large numbers of businesses or users. So for us, SantaCon was an umbrella organization that had access to 5,000 users at once. The, tur the state tourism board and the state parks have access to massive numbers of businesses underneath them. So by selling to them, and now we're looking at Main Street organizations, like we're talking with um, downtown, the downtown Newark partnership, because they oversee like 150 businesses. So by selling to them, we then get um, entree to all of those businesses as opposed to going one by one because that would just take too long. So we're really looking at those higher level organizations that we can sell to that have access to a lot of um, lo uh, businesses or users underneath them, like a university, for example. <laughs> Another question? All right, I'm going to ask a last question then. Um, you, I don't know whether you could actually hear the earlier panels. I guess you were, you were seated here for a while. I asked some of the other people whether there was an aha moment, whether there was a, a moment in your experience where you were really surprised by something that, that happened in a way that you had not expected it to happen. So I'm, I'm just curious whether in this process, A, has there been such a moment for you when you said, whoa, I never would have predicted that, uh, and then you went down that path, and uh, B, is there something that you've now, now you're graduating, you're about to walk out of here, you've got this under your belt, you're, you're in the middle of it, you know, is there something that you've gained from this experience that you would like to say, you know, I never would have thought that I'd be thinking like this, this, and this on my graduation day? Uh, I, maybe, maybe those things haven't happened, but if they have, I'd like to hear about them. Anybody? Yeah, I know, I know for me, I never would have thought going into my like, four years of university that I'd be coming out, starting my own company. I mean, that's insane. I never would have thought that would have been happening. Uh, an amazing journey, for sure. Um, I think one of the aha moments I had was when our, probably our first major paying customer with the state of Delaware. I mean, that was, that was awesome. Someone actually wanted the value we had created. Uh, so that was a, that was a great moment for me. Uh, to me, I, I think the biggest aha moment was 
So uh, we went to Minnesota for a pitch competition and we placed sixth place out of 185. So we did really well. We didn't win, but we did very well. Um, and the judge told us, hey, listen, you guys have this really cool technology, but the big part that you need to focus on is this analytic side because it's incredibly powerful that you can quantify things that are this, to this point currently unquantifiable. Then I went home and I was speaking with my dad who he works at a, um, at a car dealership and they were speaking with their marketing company saying like, hey, like, why are we paying you all this money? We're not seeing any more people in the door or any more, um, or any more money in the bank. And they were like, no, we're bringing people in, we swear, but they couldn't quantify it. And I was like, oh, snap, like this, this, <laughs> actually, like, this is actually like a real problem. Like this, this guy from Minnesota told me this, my dad, I'm hearing it from a bunch of different people. So I really realized that we were really solving a real, and Vince says the same thing, we were solving a real problem. So it was, it was a really big uh, aha moment. Keith, did you want to? Yeah, I guess for me, it was uh, probably a little earlier, like over the summer, because uh, when we first started, there was kind of like this cool technology that didn't really make a whole lot of sense. Like it, <laughs> we knew what it was, but we <laughs> couldn't describe it. Uh, and then definitely Pokemon Go coming out helped us a lot, but uh, that's a little besides the point. Uh, it was definitely like <laughs> going around just talking. There was like one day, I think we had like three meetings just talking to some like potential people. Um, and all of them all had different ideas about how they could use it, but they were all interested and it was all like, doable with what we had and that's when it was kind of like okay this could be something that like we could find some space for okay i'd like to say thanks to keith doggett jason bamford and jordan gonzalez thank you all very yeah, very much thank you. and congratulations thank you. on your graduation yeah and thank you for having us yeah thank uh, you. a little hard to follow up the first one <laughs> no 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 you guys are great dr barner yeah i just wanted to say toss me toss me that I think I have a mic now. Oh, you do? So, okay, sorry. Well, I wanted to say thank you to everyone. Thank you to Ralph for posting this. That was a great job. Very great. Really appreciate that. GeoSwap, all the previous panelists. I invite everyone back over to uh, Evans Hall if you want to see what's next next. We have 80 posters of uh, student work and ideas. And so in there, there's some gems of uh, what will be on the stage next year or the year to come. Uh, and maybe on your phones in the, in, the, in the years to come after that. So <laughs> please come on over, see the posters. There's food, there's beverage, uh, all those kinds of things. And uh, hopefully you can join us tomorrow as well for some additional activities. So thank you all.